This is what has happened to the body of Christ after the apostles were gone. When we stop listening to the apostolic voices, we start listening to other folk. And then we did exactly what Jeroboam's getting ready to do. Watch what he does. He said, now, if this people go up to do sacrifice <laughs> in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people is going to turn again to their Lord, even to Rehoboam, king of Judah. You got the picture. You've got Jerusalem, and you've got Judah, and you got Rehoboam. But then you have Ephraim, Shechem, Ephraim, Jeroboam, House of Israel. Not the same folks. And this is a tragic mistake we make when we read the scripture. We don't acknowledge that. So we don't know what Jesus came to do. <laughs> here. Now watch this. <laughs> called him out of Egypt. That they sent and they called him and Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel came and he spoke unto Rehoboam saying, your father made our yoke grievous. Now therefore make now, therefore, make the grievous service of your father and his heavy yoke that he put on us lighter, and we will serve you. So Jeroboam comes and he says to Rehoboam, he said, listen, your father, you know, he, 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 was, he, he was a tough boss. You know, it was tough serving your dad. So listen, if you will make our yoke lighter, we will serve you. But watch. So Rehoboam said, tell you what, depart for three days and then come, up, come back. And so the people departed. Now watch what Rehoboam does. Here is another little error that happens in the body of Christ today. And I'm seeing this more now than ever. And I've been around for a minute. This isn't my first rodeo. I've been around for a minute. But watch what happens. King Rehoboam consulted with the old men, the elders that stood before Solomon, his father, while he yet lived and said, what kind of advice do you give me? How should I answer these people? So Rehoboam went to those who stood before Solomon. He went to those who has some wisdom. It went to those who have been around for a minute. He, he, he went to those known to be able to provide sound counsel, sound instruction. These are not novices. And this is part of the problem. And, you know, Paul refers to this. And, and Paul said, you know, don't put a novice in a position of authority. And, and this is a lot of what's happening um, in the body of Christ today. See, everything that's written in these scriptures are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world would come so that we would know how we ought to order and govern our lives. But he goes to the old men. How should I answer? So they told him, if you will be a servant to these people, and you'll serve them and answer them and speak good words to them, then they will be your servants forever. So if you want to build a loyal people that you're going to govern, you need to serve them. See, ministry is about serving People, ministry is not about being served. 
Let me say that again. Ministry, true ministry, is about serving people, not having people serve you. And so much of our ministry today is about ministry wanting to be served by the people. So carry my briefcase, get me some water. And we call this submission and accountability. <laughs> That's what we call it. Because we like to take those little deviations from truth and rationalize them and try to justify them. And then we build doctrines to support it. And then before you know it, we got a mess on our hands. And this is why we have so much church abuse. This is why we have so many people being hurt by the ministry. Because ministry is trying to lord over people, not serve people. This is the advice that the old men gave to Rehoboam. But watch this. Verse 8. He forsook the counsel of the old men, which they had given him. But watch what he did. He consulted with the young men that were grown up with him, which stood before him. So we're going to reject the wisdom of the elders. We're going to reject that because they're out of touch. God's doing a new thing. So these folk who've been around for a minute, uh, you know, they are washed up and God's moving them, you know, off the scene so he can raise up this new breed of the Joshua generation and God's raising up kings and God is doing this. Folk, listen, I heard that stuff 25 years ago. <laughs> I was preaching messages on the Joshua generation 25 years ago. It's not a new revelation. This stuff just keeps going around in circles. You know why? Because we're not consulting the wisdom of the elders. We're not listening to those who have walked this thing out all their life and can help us to avoid some pitfalls. So we make the same dumb mistakes that they did instead of listening to their wisdom to avoid the pitfall. Why? Because we're getting counsel from people who came up with us. We just got saved. Tacking prophet and apostle on our name. And then all of our little friends <laughs> do the same thing and think that they're making headway in the kingdom of God. And they're really not. They're just creating a mass of confusion. And a lot of people are being hurt spiritually by a lot of this. But as I stated, we are in a time of reformation and restoration. God is putting a check on all of this stuff. So, verse 9, he said unto them, what counsel, now this is the young men, this, this is boys, this is posse. <laughs> so he said unto them, well, what counsel? Do you give me that we can answer this people who have spoken to me saying, make the yoke which your father did put upon us lighter. And the young men that came up with him spoke unto him saying, well, God showed me that if you speak, I, I, I just put that, I just put that in the text. That's not in the text. God showed me. I just thought I'd throw it in because it's so appropriate for the way we handle the word of God today, right? So he says, <laughs> this is how you should speak to the people that spoke to you. Tell them this. Your father made our yoke heavy, but make you make it lighter <laughs> unto us. Tell them this. My little finger is going to be thicker than my father's loins. If you think you had it bad under my father. Wait till I get finished with you. If you think the last generation of church leadership was bad, if we don't heed the counsel 
of the elders. If we don't make corrections to those little errors that crept into the faith years ago and has everything on this really weird trajectory, if, if we don't make those adjustments, if you think the last generation of leadership was a mess. Watch what happens with this current generation of leadership because can't nobody tell them nothing. They know because they read a couple theology books. So the young man, <laughs> verse 11. And now, whereas my father laid you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father chastened you with whips I'm a chasing you with scorpions. My father, he just whipped you. I'm a turn some scorpions loose on you. See, bad leadership causes people to be constantly bit by scorpions, by serpents, by devils. People want to know why they got so many problems with the devil. Some of it could have to do with the leadership that you're sitting up under. They're the ones releasing the scorpions on you. Verse 12. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day, as the king had appointed him, saying, come to me again the third day. And the king answered the people roughly and forsook the old men's counsel that they gave him and spoke to them after the counsel of the young men. Young men. And that's what we have today. And I see this on social media a lot. We, I, I see a lot of young men new in the faith trying to correct people, <laughs> calling folk to repent over stuff that may or may not even be sin, trying to prove their little doctrinal points that they got from their favorite preacher, who's questionable also. My father made your yoke heavier. I will add to your yoke. My father also chastised you with whips, but I'm a chasing you with scorpions. And when the king wouldn't listen to the people, because this thing was from the Lord. Now watch this now. This thing was from the Lord because God had spoken a prophetic word to Solomon. When God speaks a prophetic word, people are carrying out that word, whether they know it or not, whether they're on the right side or the wrong side, they are still carrying out the word of the Lord. Why? Because God's word will not return unto him void. Whatever God said he's going to do, we can try to explain it away, rationalize it away, spin it away. Whatever God said he's going to do, that is what he's going to do. And that's the only thing he's going to do. He's not obligated to do anything but to fulfill his word. He's not obligated to confirm our every whim of prophecy. He's not obligated to confirm our every declaration and decree. I declare and decree. He's not obligated to do any of that. The only thing God is obligated to do is to fulfill the word of his covenant. So if we don't know the terms of the covenant, if we're not talking about the covenant, we cannot expect God to confirm anything. God confirms his word with signs following. And that's whether or not people believe God still does signs, wonders, and miracles. Them not believing that God does signs, wonders, and miracles is not stopping God from doing signs, wonders, and miracles. One of the reasons we're not seeing more true signs, wonders, and miracles is because much of what we're preaching and teaching isn't the word. And God is only obligated to confirm his word. Oh, glory. <laughs> Mm. I hope you're getting something out of this. So the king didn't listen because this thing was from the Lord. 
so that he could perform his saying, which the Lord spoke unto Ahijah, the Shilonite, and Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. So when all Israel saw that the king didn't listen, the people answered and said, what portion do we have in David? See, Jeroboam and the people that had come to him, they were from the seed of Ephraim. And we'll talk about Ephraim a little further down the line. They were of the tribes of Israel. They were. But they weren't from the right tribe. <laughs> Okay, so they said, what portion do we have in David? Neither have we any inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel. Now see to your own house, David. So Israel departed unto their tents. But as for the children of Israel, which dwelt in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. Verse 19. So Israel rebelled against the house of David unto this day. And it came to pass when all Israel heard that Jeroboam was come again, that they sent and called unto him to the congregation and made him king over all Israel. There was none that followed the house of David, but the tribe of Judah. You got the picture. Here is where the kingdom was divided. Here is where the word that God spoke to Solomon. I'm going to take the kingdom from you and I'm going to give it to your servant. I'm going to take the kingdom from you and I'm going to give it to your son. What did God do? He divided the kingdom, gave part of it to Rehoboam, his son, and the other part to Jeroboam, his servant, thus fulfilling the word that he spoke to Solomon. Why don't we believe God confirms his word? Why don't we believe that God is actively involved in the affairs of men? Why don't we believe that God is still working out his plan and his purpose, that there are no accidents, there are no coincidences? God is fulfilling his plan and purpose, whether we're talking about for the corporate body or whether we're talking about your individual life. God has spoken over your life and into your life. God is going to bring that word to pass, but you have to to be willing to walk in covenant. That's how Solomon lost the kingdom. He didn't walk in the covenant. We cannot walk in disobedience to the commands of Jesus and expect to see God's purpose for our lives fulfilled. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. And I know there's a distorted presentation of the sovereignty of God that says everything that happens has to be the will of God. Nothing can happen that's not the will of God. Folk, God's not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. Will all come to repentance? No. Why? Because God is not going to force himself on any human being. Ask Adam. All right, moving right along. I didn't intend on saying a whole lot of this. So, you know, I'm glad you tuned in because you have obviously been praying about some of these issues and God is using this conversation to answer your questions. King Rehoboam. <laughs> Verse 21. When Rehoboam was come to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah with the tribe of Benjamin. That's the other tribe that makes up the house of Judah, the tribe of Judah and Benjamin. That's it. <laughs> all of the other tribes were part of Israel. These are the only tribes that remain faithful to the house of Judah. 
So, properly speaking, biblically speaking, the only Jews there are are the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. I'm just reading what's there, folks. <laughs> I, I know this is not what is taught in the halls of academia. I get it. I understand that we've been sold a bill of goods about Israel, who was Jewish, was the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. That is who made up the house of Judah. Those are the only Jews. All the other tribes, Dan, Naphtali, Manasseh, Ephraim, all the other tribes are Israelites, not Jews. Y'all stay with me now. Y'all stay with me. This is why Jesus needed to go through Samaria. <laughs> now watch. Rehoboam comes and he gathers the tribe of Benjamin and they're going to fight against the house of Israel because they want to bring the kingdom back from Jeroboam <laughs> to Rehoboam. God divided it, but they're going to go to war to bring the kingdoms back, to bring the tribes back. Listen, warfare in this sense never can undo what God has done. God divided it. You are not going to use human instrumentalities and human tactics to put it back together again. Watch. But, verse 22, the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah, the man of God. <laughs> Isn't that what we say? The man of of God. The word of God came to Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, Listen, God always has a man <laughs> or one man that he can send a word through. God always has a voice in the earth, God always has voices in the earth that can speak to the kings of the earth what the God of heaven and earth has to say. See? <laughs> God's always got a voice in the earth. So he says, speak unto Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, the king of Judah, and unto all the house of Judah and Benjamin, and to the remnant of the people, and tell them, this is what God said. Do not go up and fight against your brethren, the children of Israel. Who's he talking to? I thought he was talking to the children of Israel. No, he's talking to the house of Judah, telling the house of Judah not to go and fight against their brethren, the house of Israel. <laughs> Don't go up and fight. Because this thing is from me. So they listen to the word of the Lord and they return to depart according to the word of the Lord. But watch what Jeroboam does. Verse 25. Then Jeroboam built Shechem. Where? In Mount Ephraim. Oh, wait till we talk about Ephraim. We're talking about Ephraim, the son of Joseph that he had in Egypt by that Egyptian woman. <laughs> Jeroboam built Shechem in Mount Ephraim and he dwelt there and he went out from there and he built Peniel. And Jeroboam said, now watch this. Jeroboam said in his heart, now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. If this people, now he's talking about the Israelites. He's talking about the 10 tribes who called to anoint him 
to be their king. But he is so <laughs> insecure and what God set him up to do, now he's going to revert back to human thought, human practice, human ingenuity. And watch what he does. Because this is what has happened to the body of Christ after the apostles were gone. When we stop listening to the apostolic voices, we start listening to other folk. And then we did exactly what Jeroboam's getting ready to do. Watch what he does. He said, now, if this people go up to do sacrifice <laughs> in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people is going to turn again to their Lord, even to Rehoboam, king of Judah. You got the picture. You've got Jerusalem, and you've got Judah, and you got Rehoboam. But then you have Ephraim, Shechem, Ephraim, Jeroboam, House of Israel. Not the same folks. And this is a tragic mistake we make when we read the scripture. We don't acknowledge that. So we don't know what Jesus came to do. <laughs> he came to restore the whole house of Israel. He came to rejoin the house of Israel and the house of Judah. This is prophecy. He said, I will take them both. I will call them back out of every nation that I have driven them. And there will be one people and there will be one God over them all. This is what the New Testament is trying to tell us. There's one God, just one. There's one body of Christ, just one. There's one covenant people of God, just one. There's one king, one head over the house. That's Jesus. Because that's what he came to do, to seek and to save that that was lost. So Jeroboam <laughs> said, these folk, if, 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 if I let them go up to Jerusalem to worship like God commanded, their heart going to turn back to Rehoboam. So what did the king do? What did Jeroboam do? He took counsel. But what did he do? He made two calves of gold. <laughs> See, we're getting, ready, we're getting ready to go back to the same rebellion and apostasy that the nation of Israel experienced when they were wandering in the wilderness, when they were waiting on Moses to come down from getting instruction from the Lord, they got bored. So they took off all of their jewelry, threw it in the fire, melted it down. And what did they make? They made calves of gold to worship them. This is what you call paganism. What is Jeroboam doing? He is resorting back to paganism. Watch. Two calves of gold and said unto them, it's too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold your gods, plural. <laughs> now, Judah understood then as they understand now. There is only one God. But in this paganistic system that Israel was living in, <laughs> much like our own, they made calves of gold and said unto them, it's too much for you to go up to Jerusalem to worship the true and living God. Behold your gods, plural, paganism. O Israel, which brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And he set one of them in Bethel. He put the other one in Dan. And this thing, what thing? What he just did, this building gods for the people, this, this paganistic practice that he's introducing, this thing became a sin. For the people went to worship 
before the one, even unto Dan. But watch. Verse 31. He made a house of high places. <laughs> so not only did he create gods for the people, he even built a house to put the gods in. I'm laughing because I know where this is headed. <laughs> this thing became a sin. So he made a house of high places. So he created their gods, built them a house to worship these false gods in. <laughs> and then he made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. <laughs> so <laughs> he creates false gods, built a false house of worship, and then he sets in false priests. They were not Levites. They were not called. They were not anointed. They were not set apart. This was the lowest of the people. This is anybody that had a cell phone and an internet connection. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but, but, but this is what's going on. He makes priests of the lowest of the people. Anybody that wanted to be a priest could be a priest. Step right up, pay your fee, and you too can be a, a prophet. You too can be a priest. You too can be whatever you want. Step right up. Then he, he ordained a feast in the eighth month on the 15th day of the month that was like the feast that is in Judah. And then he offered on the altar. So he did in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel the priests <laughs> of the high places, which he had made. So he offered upon the altar, which he had made in Bethel, the 15th day of the eighth month, even the month that he had devised of his own heart, and he ordained a feast unto the children of Israel, and he offered upon the altar and burnt incense, a whole system of false worship for Israel in Ephraim. Do you, you, you see the picture here? That's why I needed to go through this, because I think a lot of times we don't understand what we're actually reading about when we're reading the Old Testament story. So we just think that the Old Testament is just, a, yeah, you know, it's just some some stories about folk back then. You know, it's, it's you know, that's about how God dealt with his people back then you know, under that dispensation. No, this, this isn't an issue of dispensations. This is an issue of covenant and it's an issue of purpose. And so what Jeroboam does, Jeroboam builds an entire false system. It is a substitute system of worship, which includes its gods, its house of worship, its priests, its practices and its offerings. Everything God gave to the whole house of Israel, this divided house of Israel now under Jeroboam creates a false system of worship. This has happened to the new covenant church today. We have built a false system of worship. We've got our own gods, plural. We've got our own churches, houses of worship, quote, unquote. We've got our own priests, 
who are not Levites, so they do not understand the ways of the Lord. Now, I'm not saying we're under the Levitical priesthood. That's not what I'm saying. But the Levites were set apart unto God. The Levites were called by God. The Levites were called and anointed by God under Aaron, the high priest. The Levites were chosen by God and sent by God, just like Jesus called the apostles and sent them, just like men and women of God have been called into the ministry of the word, prepared in the ministry of the word, taught the word, and then sent to proclaim the word. But we don't have the time to go through that now. That takes too long. That takes too long. Why, why do I have to go study? Why do I have to be prepared? Why do I need to learn how to serve? Why do I need to do this? Why do, why do I need to do that? You know, just give me a cell phone. Let me prophesy over some people and share these strange visions that I have because I have a, I, I have a blown way out of proportion imagination that I've never learned to take captive by the word of the Lord. So everything, every thought that passes through my mind, I think it's God speaking to me. Now, I don't really know the biblical story, but I think God is talking to me. <laughs> so he builds this whole system of worship. That is the sin of Jeroboam. And every king that we read about after that, chapter 13, 14, 15, and 16, all of the kings, it says the same exact thing. He walked in the sin of Jeroboam. In other words, they never corrected that initial error. They never stopped doing their own pagan practices. They never stopped and returned back to the covenant. Ultimately, it led to the showdown on Mount Carmel with Elijah and the prophets of Baal. That's how far out that thing actually got because they didn't correct it. By the time we get to 1 Kings chapter 17, we see Elijah coming to challenge the prophets of Baal who were whose prophets? Jezebel's prophets. See, all of this ties into the New Testament. But because we don't understand what God is trying to show us under the old covenant, when we read the new covenant, we start making stuff up. <laughs> so, so every woman that wears makeup got a spirit of Jezebel. Listen, Jezebel has nothing to do with makeup. Jezebel has nothing to do with how long your dress is or how short your hair is cut. That has nothing to do with the spirit of Jezebel. Jezebel is a spirit that interacts and fornicates with kings. You understand what I'm saying? Ahab was a king. It's the strange mixture of religious and political fornication that enables and is fueled by false prophetic voices. Folk, if this is not what we're seeing in our world today, I pray that we would wake up. Don't be like the foolish versions. Get some oil in your lamp. <laughs> so let's go back to First Kings, I'm, and I'll close this out. It says this. Verse 25, First Kings. This is where we started. But Omri worked evil in the eyes of the Lord, and he did worse than all that were before him. For he walked in all the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, in his sin. What was Jeroboam's sin? Jeroboam's sin was setting up this false system of worship for Israel. So Israel from this time has a false system of worship. Judah was still in Jerusalem, so they understood the feast. They understood the house of God. They understood 
the day of the Lord. They understood, but not Israel, because they had their own thing going on. Said he walked in all of the ways of Jeroboam and in his sin, and it provoked the Lord God of Israel to anger with vanities. Verse 28 Omri slept with his fathers and was buried in Samaria because Samaria had become the capital of Israel in the north with that false system of worship. You got the picture, okay? Verse 29, in the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, began Ahab, the son of Omri, to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria, 22 years. Where did Omri reign? He reigned in Samaria. Where was this false system of worship set up? In Samaria. And you will read through the rest of the Old Testament, God speaking prophetically about this apostasy of Israel, as well as the apostasy of Judah. It got so bad that Israel, the north, northern tribes under Jeroboam, they eventually went into captivity to Assyria and they were dispersed, they were scattered throughout the earth. This is what we refer to as the lost tribes of Israel. But they're not lost. They're still Israelites. They're still in the earth, but like Hosea said, I will call them my people, which are not my people. But then Paul in Romans says, quoting Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people. And those who were not my people shall be known as the sons of God. This is the restoration of the house of Israel. So many people have Israelite identity, but they don't know that they're Israelites. And no, I'm not talking about the black Hebrew Israelites. That's, that's the furthest thing from what I'm talking about. I'm literally talking about what has happened with the dispersion of the seed in the earth. Because remember, again, God told Abraham, through you and in your seed will all families of the earth will be blessed. So the blessing of Abraham has touched every nation, every tribe, and every people. How? Through the dispersion of the tribes of Israel from Samaria and Assyria. Stay with me. Because see, some of y'all were with me up until that point. Now y'all don't know where I'm going. <laughs> so just stay with me through these conversations. You'll understand. So that's what happened. Omri is reigning in Samaria. Now, back to John. I'm going to read this again, make a couple comments, close it out, and we'll pick it up next time. John chapter 4. Jesus must needs go through Samaria. He has this encounter with the woman at the well. You all know the story. He said, go call your husband. He talks about this living water. But in verse 21, it says this. Well, verse 19. Now notice the woman's response to Jesus. She said, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. See, they were familiar with prophets. Why? Because the house of Israel had their own prophets. There were prophets that were sent to Israel, just like there were prophets that were sent to Judah. There were prophets that were sent. God always has a prophetic voice in the earth. There has never been 
a generation who has not had true prophetic voices in the earth, despite those who say there are no more apostles and prophets. That is coming out of that false system of worship that got built. <laughs> Jesus said, well, let's back up. He says, sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Now watch verse 20. Our fathers worship in this mountain. And you say that it's in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. You, you see what's going on? Do you see the connection here with what we read in 1 Kings? That's why we have to learn to allow Scripture to interpret Scripture. We don't have to make stuff up, and it's not a deep, heavy revelation. It's a willingness to be taught by God. Isn't that what part of the new covenant was? They shall all be taught by God. <laughs> but I guess people don't believe God actually teaches people today. That's because they rely on Greek ingenuity, Greek logic, Greek thought. Because that's what got built after the apostles left. So Jesus said, woman, believe me. The hour cometh when you are neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. So in other words, where you worship, the day is coming, well, where you worship will not be limited to and isolated to a physical location in a house that's been built by man. This is what he's saying. Because remember, Judah and Benjamin, they were still in Jerusalem worship. And what caused Jeroboam to build a false system of worship was because he didn't want them to go to Jerusalem to worship. So y'all worship here. Here's your gods. Here's your house. Here's your proud. Here's your priests. This is what Jesus, this is why he needed to go through Samaria, because he had to clean up this mess. He was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Isn't that what he said? The hour's coming. You're neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Are you going to worship the Father? You worship you know not what. You don't know what you worship. <laughs> and and this, this is what amazes me because I listen to people and I listen to the way that they try to explain the scriptures. I listen to the way they try to explain God. And you have to walk away and say, you know what? You worship, you know not what. If you've got a God that you can explain in logic, you got a God that you built. <laughs> Seriously. I can barely understand me. More or less comprehension or comprehending my creator. Now, that doesn't mean we're to be ignorant about God, but at what point do we begin to acknowledge that the being and the essence and the existence and the majesty of God is beyond human comprehension, even based on what he has revealed about himself. The clearest revelation of the Father is in the Son, because the Father was in the Son. So Jesus could say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you see me, you understand the nature of God. If you see me, you understand you the nature of God. Because if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Because it's not me that's doing what I do. It's the Father that dwells in me. And we have people who are supposed to be, I don't know what they call themselves, but that's a difficult concept for people to accept that the father was in the son. 
Because now they want to go into trying to un explain the hypostatic union and what person mean and what essence mean. Folk, that's Greek philosophy. Do y'all see this? <laughs> that's Greek philosophy. The scriptures are not a Greek book. It is a Hebraic book. And as I said yesterday, I believe, and I need to correct this, because I was talking about the fact that the writers of the scriptures spoke Greek and Aramaic, because that was the lingua franca. That was the language of the time. That's what they spoke. And that's what they wrote the scriptures in. But their worldview, their understanding, their inner world was not Greek. It was Hebraic. It was formed from the utterances of God through the prophets. That's what formed them. That's what shaped their thinking. That's what shaped their understanding. And they had to take that and put it in the language of the people which was Greek and Aramaic. The New Testament is not a Greek book. So because people can read Strong's and possibly eat, read Greek doesn't mean they understand the text because they can be looking at the text through Greek eyes because of their language. The apostles spoke Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek, the apostles. When the scripture says they were unlearned and ignorant men, it doesn't mean they were stupid. It means they were unlearned and not educated in the rabbinic schools of the day run by the Sanhedrin. That's another one of those little, you know, things that we got going on. So people don't put any value on education and learning, I guess, because the Bible says they were ignorant and unlearned. Well, no, the Bible didn't say that. Actually, uh, that was an accusation that was made against them. These men are unlearned and ignorant. So how are you going to instruct us? Do you see the way we handle the word? <laughs> so anyway, Jesus said the hour is coming and now is when, well, let me back up. Um, you are neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem. Worship the Father. You worship, you know not what. We know what we worship because salvation is of the Jews. <laughs> salvation is of the Jews. Why is that? Because the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from Israel until Shiloh come. Judah and Benjamin maintained to the best degree that they did, a knowledge of the one true and living God, but more to the point, they maintain the knowledge of the journey of God with his people. So they did understand the promise of Messiah that was to come that would bring salvation, that would bring deliverance, as they understood deliverance, not as we understand deliverance and salvation. See, we only think salvation has to do with where we go when we die. No, the salvation of God has to do with the salvation of his whole created order. So there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. See, Israel understands this. The hour comes, we know what we worship. Salvation is other Jews. The hour comes and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth because the Father seeks such to worship him. So how do we worship God? We worship God in spirit and in truth. In what? In spirit and and in truth. And one of the tragedies that we have in the body today is we have people that want to just be in the spirit. 
no truth. <laughs> I just want to get over in the spirit. Then we have people who deny the expression of the spirit and all they want is truth. All they want is a head full of scriptural knowledge, but no spirit. Jesus said, you are going to have to worship God in spirit and in truth. So it takes both. It takes the Pentecostal experience and it takes a sound grounding in truth through sound doctrine to walk a balanced life and actually worship God. This keeps us out of the fringes in the spirit and it keeps us out of the pharisaical attitude of just truth. See, this is what Jesus understood. This is what Jesus modeled. Hallelujah. And he is our example. The hour comes and now is when the true worshipers are going to worship the Father in spirit and in truth because the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is a spirit. So if God is a spirit, why are we spending so much time trying to prove his essence? Jesus said, God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God is a spirit. We are natural people born of the spirit. And some people are spending an awful lot of energy trying to put God, who is a spirit, in the context of their pet doctrine. Whether it be tr a Trinitarian pet doctrine or a oneness pet doctrine. They're trying to fit God in one or the other. God is much larger than any of our pet doctrines. And what we can know about God was revealed through Jesus, the Son of God. God's the Spirit. Verse 47. Well, actually, let's go back up. Let's go to verse 39. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman that testified, he told me everything that I did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they besought him that he would stay with them and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. Why did Jesus need to go through Samaria? Because he had to take the message of the restoration of God to the Samaritans. He had to deal and correct this initial error between the house of Israel and the house of Judah, which was over the place and the practice of worship. I hope you're getting this. I, I, I hope you're getting this. I see why. I see why the father had me go down this, this particular trail here. Because there are those of you who are listening that you have been tossed to the left, to the right, forward, backward, trying to wrap your mind around what does it even mean to be saved? All of this stuff that I'm seeing and all of this stuff that I'm hearing, this can't be what Jesus died for. It's not. What Jesus died for was the restoration of the creation of God. The restoration of the dominion that was lost through Adam and through successive generations, God continually unveiled his plan 
of redemption, when we're reading about Noah's ark, we're reading part of the plan. When we read about the promise given to Abraham, we're reading another part of the plan. When we read about Isaac, we're reading another part of the plan. When we reading about, like we're doing tonight, talking about the division of the two houses, we're reading and understanding what God is doing in the earth and how not to make the same mistakes. We cannot build our own houses of worship. We cannot construct our own gods. We cannot choose to be priests. We have to be called and anointed to be priests. You you understand what I'm saying? That was the sin of Jeroboam and its final outcome was the condition that existed in the days that Jesus came. The the Samaritans had part of the truth, but they didn't have the full truth. Jesus needed to go through Samaria to let her know, listen, God, he's a spirit. He's not a calf. God is a spirit. If you're going to worship him, you're going to have to worship him in spirit and in truth. And it doesn't matter what your location is. You don't have to go to a building to worship God. You can worship God. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. You can worship Jesus in the confines of your own home. You can worship Jesus on your way to work. You can worship Jesus while you're at work. Now, that don't mean stop working to worship. No, you can worship while you work. (laughs) Glory to God. Living for Jesus is the highest expression of worship that there is. Not going to church on Sunday and lifting hands and falling on the floor, rolling in the dirt. That's not necessarily worship. It can be. Don't get me wrong. It can be. (laughs) But that is not the premium of worship. The premium of worship is knowing the word of God. Jesus, hearing the word of God, Jesus through the text, obeying the word of Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's living in covenant, loving the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and then love your neighbor as yourself. And let me say this, we cannot say that we love God who we haven't seen while we hate our brother or sister who's created in the image of God. So we hate people, but we say we love God. Jesus said, you can't do that. That's why you must be born again. There needs to be a conversion of the heart, the circumcision of the heart. Under the old covenant, they were circumcised on the male reproductive organ. Under the new covenant, there's the circumcision of the heart, which confirms and brings us into the covenant. What covenant? The covenant that God made with the house of Israel. (laughs) I'm going to stop right there. I'm not done, but I'm going to stop right there. Jesus needed to go through Samaria. And hopefully, in this conversation, you got a little understanding about what Samaria in Scripture is really talking about. Hopefully, you got an understanding about this whole issue with who's a Jew, who's an Israelite. Are, 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 are all Jews, is that all of Israel? You know, are, are the the lost tribes, are they, are they extinct or are they just not identifiable by ethnicity? <laughs> because they've been scattered among the nations of the earth from Assyria. Oh, this gets interesting. And we're going to pick up and we're going to continue and share some more insights in this. Well, again, I hope you got something out of this conversation. Thank you so much for your time and I appreciate your prayers. I, Those of you that uh, are supporting this work financially, I bless you in the name of the Lord Jesus and I pray increase on the seed that you sow. 
let's just all stop and ask ourselves, has there been any little errors that I may have picked up on that over time has really done a disservice to me understanding the word of the Lord. And if there is, may we be humble enough to allow that correction so that we can get back on course. So we can get back on course. Preaching the power of Jesus and the reality of their united kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. Be sure to like this. Be sure to share. Be sure to subscribe to this conversation so that you can be aware when I'm doing and uploading additional conversations of this nature. Again, if you'd like to contact me, my email is on the screen. There's some additional information that's coming on the end of the broadcast uh, of how you can visit the website and the different media platforms that you can watch Freedom Creation on. I bless you in the name of the Lord Jesus. May you walk in the light of his word and in the comfort of his spirit. Amen. Amen. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you.